time to start. Uh, my name is uh, Giacomo or James, uh, for those that cannot pronounce correctly my name. And uh, I, am, I represent the Titan and Chamber of Commerce. And today uh, we are here to welcome our speaker, Chef Daniel Bucher uh, from Marriott Hotels. Um, and uh, today we'll talk about uh, zero food waste uh, with our subtitle, which is uh, tackling one of the biggest uh, global contributors to climate change. What is it? What is being done? What are business opportunity and what is Thailand current and future role in reducing loss and waste? Uh, okay, another important thing to say is that uh, Chef Daniel joined Bank of Marriott Marquis Queens Park uh, in the pre opening phase in 2016 as executive senior sous chef. He's responsible for uh, catering at the hotel extensive conference and bucketing facilities. He's also heads up the hotel food and beverage sustainability project, including the food waste uh, uh, initiative. And uh, you also act as an honorary food waste ambassador for TSEB. We have someone in, uh, in the group today that is representing TSEB and food waste advisor for the UN in Bangkok. Okay, Daniel, uh, I close this uh, brief introduction and leave to you this virtual stage, you can start. Fantastic. Well, good to see such a good turnout. It is a complicated topic and uh, I'm happy to see that there is uh, a big demand in knowing more about it, talking about it. It is something we have seen in the industry increasingly over the last two years, for sure. Like food waste is a topic that is more and more talked about that becomes something uh, that also is on the customer's mind, on the guest minds, on everyone's mind. So, um, at the same time, there's a lot of confusion around it. There's a lot of question marks around it. Uh, and there's a lot of questions on what do we actually do about it and how do we approach it? And so as much as there's questions, there's also answers. And obviously sometimes it's difficult to bring those together. Um, and today I wanna walk you a little bit through what is the actual problem? What are the different terminologies and uh, what is being done? Um, it's like an hour time is nowhere near enough to uh, to make you complete experts in a topic of food waste. But what I do want to do is I want to get your emotional buy-in a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep this a bit emotional uh, uh, so you also understand just emotionally why so, um, we did the, the, the basics in terms of data and in terms of understanding the challenge, also the opportunities. Um, and I will finish off with showing you a few case studies um, and finally also what we do here in the hotel and what we have been doing. So you get an understanding of what could that look like. And as Giacomo said already, um, I'm not only here speaking for Marriott, um, I also especially in the realm of food waste, different hats and work with a lot of different organizations. Many players in the game. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm sort of connected with many different people. And what I will share with you today is uh, not all textbook Marriott, but there's also a lot of things coming in there that uh, are from a lot of reading or um, other sort of A lot of the people I actually know uh, on here, but not everyone. I'm assuming you all work somewhere in the food realm. Uh, because uh, not on a series on food innovations. But if you could use the chat and sort of give us a quick idea where you sit in this food waste complexity, whether you are a food retailer, um, say a grower or on the food production end, in policy or in events, in food selling, um, just throw that in the chat box and I will continue to talk and at some point 
I might uh, reference to it, but I'm we're just curious to see that. I will throw out a few questions in between and I'd love for you to just use the chat box to give quick feedback. And if there's something interesting there, we will pick it up. Uh, the same thing goes for questions or comments. Please just keep using the chat box and throw them out there. Whatever makes sense to answer straight away, I will answer straight away and whatever makes sense to keep for later. Uh, Giacomo will come back to it when we do the Q&A later. Um, so what I will start with is this. And uh, if you've worked in the food waste uh, scheme or if you have sort of read up on food waste, I'm sure you have heard of these numbers in the, in the news wherever, in reporting. So one third of the global food supply ends up in the bin. That's a figure that is referenced a lot. So one third of the food we're producing currently is being wasted. At the same time, we also have about 870 million people worldwide that are undernourished or starving, um, which is a huge disconnect and sort of an ethical problem or, or, or like a, a social problem that feels like it doesn't make sense. Like anyone who handles food and is a chef, we hate wasting stuff, throwing stuff away. It feels like this can't be right. Like we have all the food there and still we have so many people starving. Um, at the same time or additional to that, we're looking at uh, 9 billion people, a world population in 2050 by their current estimates or over 9 billion people. Um, it has been calculated or brought forward by a few different studies that the current, the current food system aren't efficient enough. There's not enough food being produced the way we currently produce food to feed those additional uh, people. Whereas that food that's being wasted year on year would be enough to feed another 3 billion people. So um, again, not only for uh, people that are currently starving, also looking at the future of our food systems and looking at the next few years, it seems like a pressing problem to fix this issue. The current estimates are that this food thrown out is valued at around 1.2 trillion US dollars. Um, with, with about 1.3 billion tons wasted each year, which sounds like a crazy compelling opportunity. Like it sounds like this, there's, there's, there's money to be made and there must be a huge business case for fixing this. And we'll look at that a little bit later, but uh, this, this is sort of the number that's out there, like 1.2 trillion US dollars value um, that is being thrown out, just disposed of. Um, it, it is 8% of the global emission uh, of greenhouse gas emission is due to that food being wasted. Um, and this is not even uh, looking at everything down the line, say the energy needed to produce the food, like uh, a farmer also needs a tractor that uses gas, uh, uses petrol and so on. This is really just looking at the actual um, energy in the food being wasted. And also at this point, I wanna mention already that most of it lands in landfills and landfills produce methane gas, which is a super active greenhouse gas. So it's like 34 times more reactive than CO2. So methane is a big contributor and uh, landfills are definitely something we should be avoid. To transport this food, uh, we're using about 300 million barrels of oil. Um, there's a rising cost of food that often gets contributed to food waste. So the logic here is if we manage to keep that extra food in the supply chain, it wouldn't cost anything more to produce it because the costs are already there. So we could sell food cheaper. So the rising cost of food or keeping food prices low is often contributed to the food that's being wasted. And then the last thing I have on this list that you hear often is that this food waste also contributes to food price volatility, meaning the constant fluctuation of food prices. Um, and uh, this obviously is worst for the poorest uh, people in the world, like the second food prices rise, it affects people that already have very limited access to purchasing food. Um, what I wanna say about these numbers upfront, um, while they definitely show you the indication of how important it is to action in this realm. They all go back to a study from the Swedish Institute of Food and Biotechnology in 2011, 
And this study was done for the FAOO, for the Food and Agriculture Organization that's a part of the United Nations. And it was commissioned to look at global food loss and food waste. And this is what the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 is based on. And back then it was sort of a first look into the systematics of food, uh, into the, like, the food systems, the systematic of how food systems work and the waste. Um, and it, it, it was understood at that point that it might be a, an easy thing to get a bit more data on, get a, get a more solid reading later on and then action on it. Um, and uh, so, so there the statement from the FAO back then was one third of all food produced is being wasted. Now, um, to nine years in, uh, we have realized that it's way more complicated than we initially thought it is to even determine what the real number is. So the FAO has changed their official wording from one third now to a sizable chunk of the food produced is being wasted, which is... Uh, basically saying it, it is so complex, the topic is so complex that we struggle really to put a hard figure on it. And I hope in this presentation you also get an idea of why. Nonetheless, it really indicates that the direction of wasting so much food seems wrong, seems absolutely wrong. And, and I hope you relate to this emotionally also at home when you throw something in the bin that should be, should, could have been eaten or that it was delicious yesterday it sort of makes you feel bad and, and it, it can't be right. Like it can't be right, can't be the way we handle our food. 12.3, um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 is on food loss. So 12 is on responsible consumption and production. 12.3 is the one we're talking about right now, which talks about reducing food loss and food waste by 50% by 2030. And uh, this was a massive ambitious target that was put out there uh, in 2015 when the UN SDGs were signed off. Um, however, it has, until now, it has shown that it is way more complex than we initially thought. And it is even hard to frame that target properly. To understand that, I wanna look with you at this quickly. This is, um, this is a color from a coloring book uh, of my kids. Uh, I have two sons and this is from, from I saw this picture in one of their uh, paint, painting books and uh, I immediately scanned it and used it in presentations because I feel I think this sort of shows how most of us think about the food system or, or like this is sort of the this is the way you would explain explain to someone how does food actually get to you and what happens with food so it's, it's a little bit like a little a little board game you start at the beginning there's a little farm there you till the soil plant the seed sun energy is added uh, something grows, you farm that. Maybe you do some crop refining to, to, to have better crops or better genetics next year. And you grow your crops, you harvest, you produce. You process the produce, here you see some jams, maybe you've been growing strawberries, so you make strawberry jams. You transport it to where it's supposed to go, which is a wholesaler first. The wholesaler resells it possibly, that's behind the cow. And then you have a consumption phase that's you at home, you eat it, whatever you didn't eat goes in the bin, which is wasted and composted. And that's sort of where it could potentially go back into a system and the compost sort of grows back into food. I, I, just, wanna, I just wanna give you a different view at that quickly for, for one second. So imagine you went to Villa Market yesterday and bought a punnet of strawberries. Um, if you bought those strawberries at Villa yesterday, there's a very good chance it's a Driscoll's brand. Driscoll's brand is a berry producer from California. I'm sure you have it, you have a visual right now. So let's say you bought this punnet of Driscoll's yesterday at Villa Market. Um, first thing to notice, Driscoll's offers you strawberries all year round. So if you go to Villa Market tomorrow or in three months, in six months, it doesn't matter. There will be a punnet of Driscoll strawberries that looks pretty much the same, is priced the same, uh, is sitting there on the shelf and you can pick it up. Um, so what does Driscoll's actually do and how did these strawberries get from where they were grown to the shelf in Villa Market? Driscoll's doesn't actually grow strawberries. That's, that's also the first step you have to understand when you're looking at food systems. Brands often don't reflect growers anymore, with the exception of some trades like wine, for example, but even there it's shifting. So it's not Driscoll that grew the strawberries, but what, what Driscoll's does is they contract farms. 
So to make sure they can grow all year round and supply berries all year round, they have farms contracted in California, in Florida, in Mexico. Um, and currently, I looked this up uh, this morning. So if you bought the strawberries yesterday at Villa Market, uh, currently the farms that they're harvesting on is uh, Salinas or Watsonville, which is both uh, two contracted farms in California. So most likely they're from there. Um, however, you don't see that on a package and there's no way to really find out. So after they've been harvested um, on the farm, they've been harvested by hand. Uh, Driscoll's has before that, um, they hold the patent right to the breed of strawberries and other berries that they're doing, like a berry producer and processor. So the, the seedlings from the nurseries have been supplied to the farmer. The farmer has handled the growing and the hand picking. Now they've been picked. Strawberries you can't, uh, there's no automated harvesting for strawberries just yet. There's been, been a lot of work in that field, but so far strawberries are still being handpicked globally. So someone picked those berries and the farmer has brought them back, transported them from the farm to the Driscoll's cooling and packaging facility. And that is the one in California is in Santa Maria. Obviously they have different ones in different areas where they're growing. So from the farm, they went onto a truck and went to Santa Maria in California. This is where you see the true skill and, and knowledge and R&D of a company like Driscoll. They understand now how to select and sort those strawberries and how to efficiently and quickly cool them so they are able to survive a trip, say, to Thailand and are able to, to be shipped globally, right? So that's where you see also the breeding come into play, the kind of strawberries being grown, the like the strawberries in the nursery that are given out to the farmer. So here, the first step happens already after the farmer handpicked probably already some that are not so good and some were left on the field, uh, which, is, which is one part of the loss. But here you see the next part of the loss. So now Driscoll's has to select and sort and select the berries that are suitable for shipping. They then are packed and are sent to a warehouse where they're repacked in a cool container. That cool container is sent to a holding facility in an airport where it's loaded on a plane. Then from there, it most likely doesn't fly direct to here. So it has a few stops in between. Maybe it's going to Istanbul where it gets hold, held again and so on and so on. At some point, it arrives in Bangkok in this cooling container. And here they're being cleared by customs, which again, uh, in, the, in the literature on, on food loss, um, customs clearing is one of the reasons why we lose a lot of produce because this takes time. It's a paper process. It's not as easy. Um, so again, you have some 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 holds, right? Like, and maybe it's it's a day, maybe it's quicker. And the importer that actually has the license to import the strawberries picks them up at the airport. Uh, for Driscoll specifically in Thailand, there's uh, three different importers. There's Indie Food, Food Gallery, Berry Flavor. Uh, for other producers, there's maybe just one. Doesn't matter. But one of them comes, picks up the product, and has to handle it now. So for them to not get any complaints from Villa Market, they have to sort again. So they will go through the strawberries again, sort out the ones that aren't perfect, that didn't make the trip, and the rest is sold to the supermarket. So again, here you have waste. The supermarket now puts them up on the shelf and they will have to look every day again what is still good to sell. Uh, and every day, some of the punnets that are sitting on the shelf coming off again because maybe the berries don't look so nice anymore. And you bought one that looks great and put it in your fridge, and, but you don't eat them today. Uh, you bought them yesterday, you want to eat them today. And you again look at the punnet and see maybe there's one moldy and two squished at the bottom, which in best case scenario, you're smart enough to eat the rest. In worst case scenario, maybe you also throw that whole thing in the bin. So you, you see sort of in this whole process of how we trade and make food today, there's a lot of possible steps of where food can get lost. Um, the, some literature speaks about a seven to one ratio. It's very difficult to put a number on it because it's different on product, different on supply chain and so on. But seven to one, you read somewhere, this means you need seven times the amount of land to get a product to a supplier if you handle it through our supply chains than if you were just eating it off the land. So uh, it's, it's, it's a staggering figure and it's very hard to really sort of get to a final figure. But it is important to remember that most of the food we buy is traded along a supply chain. So what happens with all this waste along the way? It ultimately lands in some sort of waste disposal. So most of the, uh, most of the common waste disposal method throughout the world today is still landfilling. When you hear landfill, what is the landfill? Um, a lot of people maybe don't think about where does trash go when I throw it in the bin. 
gets picked up and then what? So when, when you basically think about taking your trash and throwing it on the ground, and if everyone throws it on the same piece of land, that's the most basic piece of land filling, which is called open dumping. If we dig a hole first and then we all throw it in the same hole, that's called open land filling. But both of these are sort of still methods that are being used. And in Thailand, actually over 50% of our waste disposals are still open dumping or open landfilling. So it's basically just a designated piece of land where we all allowed to throw our trash. Um, we don't have to, we don't even have to mention that, that there's a lot of impacts from doing this, obviously on human health, the people living around there, the communities around there, but also, as I mentioned before, greenhouse gases, a lot of methane production, but also all the, all the leakage, all the, all the sort of like, you know what smells like garbage the, the water you get at the bottom of your garbage bin if you throw stuff away at home and it's swimming at some point in this little thing uh, that's what also smells bad so obviously this also happens on landfilling and this goes into groundwaters goes into rivers ultimately into oceans and damages way more than just the piece of land where you throw in your garbage um, what you see on this picture is not a open dumping landfill. This is a modern landfill. So this is uh, when you when you hear about a sort of new innovation or there's a lot like prices are given out for technology developments in the waste disposable part uh, of this equation. And here you see sort of the, the latest the latest you can possibly buy for your landfill. So you'll see a leachate collection system and a leachate treatment system which basically is supposed to suck out this water that builds up at the bottom and treat it in a treatment, a water treatment system, very similar to say how um, sewage is often treated in Europe. Um, then here you also see um, a landfill liner, uh, which means the whole thing is supposed to be protected from leakage. Um, so all leachate is being sucked out, nothing can go in the groundwater. Um, you also have a LFG recovery with landfill gas recovery system, which basically means the gas that's been produced is either used to create electricity um, or it's being fled off. So it's being burned off. Um, sometimes in open landfilling, there, there's been in, in Thailand, this also has happened uh, in, in Bangkok a few years ago, there was a big story of, uh, of landfills burning. Um, so sometimes if it burns uncontrolled, it's, it's, it's really bad because it's very hard to control all this methane and methane is highly flammable. So what you see here is sort of a cover. So that the landfill gets covered up daily and when it's full, reaches capacity of final cover, but still gas is being released and that's controlled and, and either produces electricity or is flared off. In the US, when you look at the current system in the US, a lot of it goes into the direction of these modern waste disposal landfills, like high tech landfills. But you can imagine it costs quite a bit of money to get a system like this running, even just a water treatment system is a big investment. And for existing landfills, you can't just turn them over into this because you would have to sort of build some new. So existing landfills just sit the way they are. The European Union has a very different approach. Um, the European Union um, has decided to go on no landfilling and is looking for very different ways to get rid of waste, more in the direction of composting um, or incineration. All of these are not perfect, right? All of these are not, I just want you to understand uh, what, what is it we talk about when we talk about a landfill. How much goes into a landfill here? I'll, I'll show you. I, I took Italy because I thought today we we're talking about Italy. So you have the comparison of the EU 28 in Italy. Um, what you see here is the per capita landfill waste uh, per year. So in Italy in 2007, we still had about 290 kilograms um, per inhabitant of Italy uh, being dumped in a landfill. So this is not total waste generation. This is what ends up in a landfill. Um, and you see the work from the European Union here, you can see very clearly that it's been paid off and, and there is a massive reduction year on year from landfilling. And the main reason for this is that there is a lot of projects funded by the European Union that take the garbage out of landfills. It doesn't mean there's less waste, right? Like when you look at the statistic, maybe the first impression you have, oh, we're wasting a lot less. That's not what this number says. Um, but what this number says is we put less of the waste we're generating into landfill. When you put Thailand in comparison to this, I made it green here, you see we still are quite high, right? So there's no, there's no figure for 2007. The first uh, measurements uh, that have been publicized in Thailand are from 2008. 
Um, and here you see uh, that the numbers are quite a bit higher. And the main problem that we can point out is that they're not decreasing, but in fact, even increasing a, a slight bit. Um, before we finger point and say, oh my God, this is so much worse the way it's handled in Thailand, I just want to point out again, this is not talking about total waste generated. This is just talking about how much of it goes into a landfill. Um, and when we talk about zero waste, one of the questions I put up front in the, in the summary of this talk is, um, what is achievable? What, what is zero waste? Um, this, this is exactly the point. Um, zero waste to landfill is often the subline you, you, don't, you don't see in here. Zero waste in total is a very different claim than saying zero waste to landfill. So th this is a terminology that you definitely have to look at when you see a claim of zero waste. Um, also interesting to put in comparison to there, uh, the recycling rate, so how much waste is being recycled and doesn't show up in the statistic, in Italy has now increased to 47.7% uh, last year, which is almost 50% recycling. That's a really good number already. Germany is the world champion in recycling. They have the highest figures for years on years, and they're at 70% uh, recycling rate. Thailand currently is at 22%. It has set a target for 30% or up, however, uh, which was supposed to be reached by 2021. Uh, currently, we're sitting at 22. I want to mention one more problem with landfilling, um, and this is a very Thai, uh, Thai problem. So in Thailand, uh, right now, about 50,000 tons a day are being landfilled. Uh, in Bangkok alone, it's around 10,000 tons a day. Um, over 50% of that is organic waste. So over 50% is food waste. Uh, one fourth of the country, uh, so the 10,000, about a fourth, of the waste in the country is being done in Bangkok. So Bangkok doesn't have permanent landfilling because the spaces available in Bangkok are too small to actually deposit all that waste. So what, what we have in Bangkok is called the transfer station. So basically they're just holding areas and from there the waste still has to be transferred to another landfill because we're overloading them currently already with too much waste. So there is a calculation on how much you can possibly put on a piece of land to still control it. Um, we way above that number in, in Bangkok and we, we seriously see, I, I just want to get you uh, to have a look at this quickly. Um, this is a documentary done by Tesco Lotus um, um, a few years back um, showing the food waste uh, landfilling situation in Bangkok. It is an actual documentary. I will post the link afterwards so you don't have to, we're not watching the whole thing now. We just do a minute in um, so you get an idea of what is happening. Mm -hmm. ขยะเข้ามาวันนึงสี่พันกว่าตันใช้เวลาเท่าไหร่ยี่สิบสี่ยี่สิบห้าปีสูงเป็นภูเขาขยะที่มันมาเนี่ยก็คือสีทหารก
I took this picture from our little farm on the rooftop garden say, we were offering only chicken eggs and the herbs we're growing. Um, if, I, if I can't grow it, I don't serve it. And everything that's a waste, say the eggshells, chickens are happy to eat back. Um, then we can talk about a zero waste solution with absolutely no waste. But is this realistic? Well, we wouldn't have salt, we wouldn't have oil, we wouldn't have bread because there's no wheat in Thailand. Um, what about strawberry cake, right? Like what, what, what is, what, do we have a right in Thailand to eat strawberry cakes even if there's no strawberries most of the year and no wheat growing to make the flour, to make the sponge cake uh, and not enough dairy to make the cream uh, for the cake? Or how about you over there in Italy? Maybe you can make the strawberry cake, but you can't have a coffee to drink with it. So if we're talking about achieving zero waste totally, um, that is a very far-fetched uh, problem because some waste always occurs in handling and production, even if it's just peelings, or even if it's just uh, something gone bad that is not uh, possible to eat anymore. And then we also have to talk about, say, bones, right? What about bones? Um, how do we, are there are they waste? How are they being brought back in the system? So it, it becomes quickly complicated, very complicated, and it is fair to say that zero waste completely is probably not achievable. But there must be a number, there must be a magic number of what is acceptable. And this is sort of the real question it comes down to. So zero waste to landfill, I think, is a must. The second question is how much waste is acceptable? How much waste is acceptable in an operation? And um, what, what is the yield we're supposed to achieve? And this is where it becomes very interesting and ultimately very complicated. So we do need to waste less. We need to save more. Uh, in an article I once read, it's not rocket science. I, I disagree. I think it is rocket science. It's very hard uh, to, to estimate what it is and how do we measure it? Whose job is it to save that? Because a, a lot of the time when food waste is prevented, it doesn't help uh, financially those who prevent it, but it helps someone else within the food chain. So how do we make this fair? And how do we set targets that sort of are fair for everyone, but also achieve the right direction? Um, this is the food waste hierarchy or food recovery hierarchy. Definitely want to mention this to you. So um, I, I often call it the food waste carrot, um, but in, in the original triangle is a food recover hierarchy chart. Um, what is important to note here is that food has different value at different parts of the chain. Um, so, so the value is not, not, can be measured differently. We can, we can, when we talk about food waste, we could talk about kilograms reduced or tons reduced. We can talk about CO2 output. We can talk about calories, right? If we, if, especially if fire from SIS is on here, when we talk about food donations, how do we measure how successful they've been? Well, it's probably best to measure them in how many meals we have provided and how do we measure sort of meals we can provide at this point in time, probably in calories. Um, but it can also be measured in value, like for a food, uh, food business provider, like for food business, it probably makes more sense to look at what can I save that is high in purchase value rather than something that's low in purchase value because that makes a business case for me to reduce uh, that specific thing. What is very important is to remember that reducing at the source must be the main thing we do. Like, it's like the only thing that is really a solution is reduction of food waste. And then further down, you have separating and measuring or feeding hungry people, donating to people, so keeping the food within the human uh, food chain. Um, if we can't do that, maybe feed it to animals, which is still like then it turns into feed. Feed is also something that's being grown. Uh, so maybe we can sort of help reducing uh, land use for animal feed and move food waste into those sections. So it's also already a gain there. And then only after that, we're looking at other diversion options like composting, recycling, and so on. And the last possible option is landfilling. Um, food food uh, waste definitions. This is from the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, I mentioned this before already. This is what the Sustainable Development Goal is built on. They separate between food loss and food waste. Food loss is the agricultural production and harvest and the processing, and after everything that ha happens after that, so distribution, retail, restaurants, catering, domestic consumption, is what they call food waste. In 2019, we have massively improved the FLI, the Food Loss Index, because since 2015, 
um, there has been a push from the United Nations to get data from all member states on this. It is still extremely weak in data points and we still have to see that there's only about 5% or 4% of the data that's in there that is actual measured credible data. A lot of it is still um, assumed data. So like maybe taken one case study and then sort of taken that measurement and um, sort of looked at the whole country and just did the numbers. So a lot of the food loss index um, it is still shaky, but there's been a lot of work being done in this part. This only looks at the five most important commodities per country. What we should look at now today as a restaurant is the food waste index. And this was promised uh, in the 2015 SDG um, sort of uh, signing that this would be the index created to look at food wastage. It's still in uh, production, it's still a work in process. 2020 was announced to be the release date of the methodological framework. So this way we might see some sort of uh, publication on the FWI, the Food Waste Index. So far, it is just there uh, as a, a work, uh, like a work in progress um, from the FAO. I do wanna, I do wanna make sure I do my due diligence on consumer waste, since you also all not just I see already so sort of where you're in the in the food chain professionally, but you're also all consumers of food. So um, RAP is a very active UK, uh, partially government funded uh, NGO that has done excessive work on consumer waste, and these are the main drivers for high level consumer waste that they have singled out. So they, they say consumer waste at home is mostly due to poor planning, uh, excess buys, date labels, uh, or misunderstanding of date labels, uh, poor storage uh, at home, sort of like keeping stuff somewhere in the fridge, not falling first in, first out, uh, over catering, sort of cooking too much, uh, maybe also when inviting people or cooking for the family, or a lack of culinary skills uh, to reuse uh, ingredients that could still be used in another dish, but sort of not knowing what to do with this. So this is what they've singled out at the most, uh, like the biggest problems why you throw stuff away at home. So to make sure I uh, leave you with something to do there, I just wanna uh, give you a little bit to think about um, what actually sells food. How do you buy food? When you look at this, uh, a pumpkin, a pumpkin that you purchase um, at home right? You, you don't purchase a pumpkin like on the picture below uh, where you only, this is how I, I sort of store a pumpkin from a supplier coming in, but this is not how you uh, purchase a pumpkin or I purchase a pumpkin when I'm not at work. The way we purchase a pumpkin is much more like what's on top. So we'll have different sort of stories going on there, not just the product. So what we have firstly is a visual. You see the pumpkin that's cut open already has a very different imagery uh, than the pumpkin packed in plastic. So the visual is extremely important and an extremely important sales argument. The price, you see, the, the price there varies massively and then there's even an item discounted. So um, that is something that triggers our purchase decision. And then the other thing you also see here is the brand or the story. So on the one, on the first pumpkin, you see farm fresh, you see sort of a brand strongly put there. Uh, on the second pumpkin, you see it's a Japanese pumpkin, whether it comes from Japan or Japanese style pumpkin or Japanese seed, that's not further elaborated, but immediately we have a story the second it says pumpkin Japanese or butternut pumpkin is again a different story, uh, different product than the first pumpkin. And then lastly, you have the organic Japanese pumpkin, which adds another layer of story to it. So when we make purchase decisions for food, we purchase with these three things in mind. We purchase with a visual, a price, and a brand or a story. What we do not purchase is nutritional value, taste of the product, health. And what we also don't purchase is all the soft skills that I think in my book matter a lot to food, like family, right? The, the, the way it's perceived with your family, the sharing of food, the people behind a certain product, the connections we have with food and ultimately with the growing of it and the soil and the earth and sort of the love that goes into growing something but also cooking something. So all of this is still in this product at some point but it's invisible to us and we can never make a purchase decision based on those so what i want to give you away today for looking at changing your consumer behavior is this think about what truly matters about purchasing a food which i think is not 
the visual, it's not the price, it's not the brand of the story, especially in Italian food. A lot of dishes don't work because they're visually super attractive. They work because they taste incredible. They taste incredible. So for me, I think taste is something that should guide our purchase decision. Now you might ask, how do I do that? Well, a lot of the time that means asking questions, asking questions about the brand, questioning the product, sort of going on the internet and looking what their brand promises. Where does it actually come from? Is it a farm? Is it a grower? Or is it a distributor? Or is it a brand that sort of contracts farm or even repurchases food and just up, like adds the story piece and sells it more expensive? And all of this will help you to make better purchase decisions and will help you value food more uh, and, and therefore maybe waste less by buying the right products uh, and buying less of them uh, because price is not your first consideration. Let's go back to the actual industry. So let's go away from home and go back to the food industry. And um, the question is a little bit, whose problem is it? Who's supposed to look at the food waste? And uh, I've been asked a lot in, in hospitality, especially in hotels or in the tourism industry, why is it our problem? Why doesn't the government do something about it? Or why doesn't the consumer do something about it? Like the consumers, they demand those products. So they should be the ones that change this, um, not us. So hospitality it is our problem in the tourism industry. It's our problem for a few reasons. One, all over Asia, eating out is the norm and not the exception. Numbers in the US are also on the rise, but in Asia especially, people eat out more than they eat at home. COVID might have changed it slightly, uh, but we'll see this also going back pretty quickly, I'm quite sure. Um, the tourism industry globally is, is growing really fast, um, especially in Asia. Uh, you all remember that Bangkok was the most visited city in the world uh, uh, two years back. Um, but, but in Asia, tourism is a big thing and a constantly growing thing when you look at, say, India, China. There's a lot of tourism coming out of these regions and tourists ultimately have to eat out and ultimately produce trash that they cannot, they have to rely on the systems in that country and in that business to take care of that waste because they can't take it home and set up a, a system that works for them. Um, also, tourism is, is a big industry, sorry, tourism is a big industry and provides a lot of jobs worldwide. So people in that industry are also people that we can train and guide and, and send into a direction where this becomes an important problem to them and where we change their mindset. So the first thing to do is data. Like the first thing to know uh, on how do I even make a difference in my business is to understand what do I even waste and where do I waste it and, and how can I, where do I start to approach it? What we've done here in the hotel is set up a system based on the light blue measure and recording system. Uh, we work with uh, light blue, which is a consultancy back then. Um, and we, we decided and set up a system that looks at those four different separations. So spoilage, prep waste, buffet waste, and plate waste. This is not the one and only solution. It's depending on where you are in the food chain. It's depending on what your first instinct is of what you would like to know. And as I mentioned before, the data globally is very slim and very, there's a lot of holes in the data. So it probably makes sense to start with the idea of what makes sense for me. What is it I need to know? But I can also tell you from a lot of talks within the industry is that we all at home and in restaurants and in hotels and even in food, in, in food production business, often underestimate how much we actually throw away because we've, we've sort of used to yield it. We have the cost of what we're wasting already in the sales price. So we are not aware of how much it actually is. But when you do the numbers, you might be surprised of how much you actually throw away. So the, the question you have to ask yourself is how many bins can I possibly put up in, in my months? Okay, um, thank you. Um, so how many bins can I possibly set up? What's the physical space I have? It is time consuming. Um, how detailed do I want to get with my analysis? Um, what makes it comparable? Um, what are the numbers I need to have comparable figures? Uh, different areas in my business operation, do I need to separate them or not? If there is a lot of suppliers now and more and more, actually it's, it's, it's a, a number of people that have, have tried to expand it globally that offer a solution to help you with the measurement and the recording. Light blue, like I mentioned, is one of them. There's also Winnow, Lean Path, Min Scraps, and others. Um, and a lot of them show you 
things like this. So I have this, this is Winnow data. Um, Winnow, for example, here looking at a total of 700 uh, data points in different operations, food operations, they work with hotels, restaurants, but also with IKEA, for example. Um, what happens typically in food waste reduction in the first year? So you see a step one, uh, this is what they call the low hanging fruit and quick wins. So you manage to reduce a lot quickly. Then you sort of have a second phase where you start to identify what actually has the highest efficiency and it becomes a bit more of a normality. And then you go into phase three, which is supposed to be the acceptable level of waste. And this is what I mentioned before. Um, we, what we need to do is reduce our food business operations to whatever is that acceptable level of waste. And what that is might be extremely different for different operations and depends on a lot of factors. And it's never final. You can always work on that. You can always bring it further down. But what you see here is, is very true for doing the first step. You'll see a, a big aha when you start it and a big sort of uh, wake up to how much am I actually wasting. But once you start reducing, you very quickly also get to this stage where it becomes very hard to find further things that are easy to reduce or the, the threshold, like the, the barrier to do more becomes bigger and bigger. Um, this also means that the data from those providers is a little bit, like it's hard for providers like Winner or Lean Park or Light Blue to stay in active contracts because once you reach that level three, um, it almost, the business case is almost out. Like when you, when you purchase a system like Winner, it's, it's a considerable investment. Um, if you decide to make that invest, investment, um, you do get a quick return, but what do you do after you've reached that level, what do you do, right? Like, do, do you continue to pay that service fee to use the systems or do you just accept that this is what we've managed to do and stop measuring and recording? And this is a very big problem we have in, in, this, in this sphere that we often see people coming on board, going through these phases and then sort of deciding that it's not worth the first and further investments because there's no business case for it. Um, and then we, we don't have data and we don't have comparable data. What happens in the long run? Like how much is there a further point and so on? Uh, typically, uh, Winner, for example, doesn't work for much more than three years with most, most of the clients because that's sort of the point uh, when, when many of them don't see uh, the return on investment anymore. Also, the, the next question on business, uh, business case is, is it actually worth it? Like, do you get uh, the money back that you invest into buying a system like that? Um, so it does, it does show that there is a substantial number in the food cost that we can reduce when we look at uh, reducing our food waste. And this is sort of what instinctively makes sense, right? We reduce uh, the waste, we throw less out, so we should, have, uh, we should have more food to sell or we should have used less input. So somewhere there should be a cost thing in there. In reality, and, and everyone that knows for, uh, how difficult it is to run a food business, the more diversified you are, the more different products you have on offer, the more preparations you have. On My Breakfast Buffet, for example, we have 600 different items. The harder it is to actually pinpoint what drives a reduction in food cost and how much of it is due to, say, a system like we know that you have in place. In addition to that, obviously these companies are still continuously trying to sell you uh, the, the investment of working with them. So there's there's a, there's a hidden. It's like I would say they all like all the companies I work with have the right uh, the right set of mind and are working on the right problem. And they went into the space because they care about food waste. But obviously the business case also is for them to continue working with someone, they need to show a reduction. So there's a lot of decisions you have to make on, on, in, 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 in calculating reduction. For example, what about a soup, right? Do we measure a soup when it's mostly water and we, a chicken soup, right? Uh, I added so much water that I haven't purchased. It comes from the tap. Do I calculate it as food waste or not? Do I strain it, which is a massive, manual effort to, to strain it out and then weigh only say the chicken pieces. Uh, what about the bones that I mentioned before? Are they food waste or are they not? What about oyster shells and so on? So it, it, they, there's, there's an incentive here to look at data in a way that it proves a reduction. Uh, it is, it, there isn't a reduction for sure. It's just very hard to put a factual monetary figure on it. 
When you look at refed, refed is a roadmap to reduce US food waste by 20%. That was done in 2016. Uh, this is based on the US, uh, but they have also tried to build the business case heavily for reducing food waste and how much money is possibly uh, to, to be made by reducing it. And they, they line out an annual business profit potential of over 1,000 million US dollars with what they call waste tracking and analytics. And now when you look a bit deeper is that this data came from Lean Path. So again, it's, it's the extrapolated data from the businesses that Lean Path has been working with. And they obviously have to show a massive reduction. Also, this is here displayed as a year on year profit uh, potential, whereas in reality probably will only have one heavy impact period where we do manage to reduce a lot of our waste. Uh, whatever we manage to do in the long run is then a completely different question that is very hard again to, to, uh, to put a monetary figure on. I don't want to talk about though, for sure there is saving potential in starting to measure, in starting to make a change. Another interesting statistic from Wino here, um, where in this, if you are in the chef's business, you get asked this a lot, also in the events business, if you do events, what should I do? Should I do a set dinner or should I do a buffet, right? Where does most of the waste occur? So when you look at uh, prepared in advance, so prepared in advance is buffet services, cocktail services, something where the chef has prepared the food and just hands it out or cook to order, so a la carte uh, services, um, the actual quantitative uh, difference in waste is not so much. It isn't so much. The difference is more uh, where does it occur. So the big difference is that in prepared vans uh, meals, you have, for example, a lot less plate waste, so stuff left on the plates because uh, people do go to the buffet and they know they can go again. So even though they leave some on their plates, uh, they don't they don't leave as much as if we do an a la carte service because it, the portion size is fixed, no matter how much I want to eat. Um, then uh, overproduction is a, is a quite a severe difference there. Obviously, if we do a buffet service, we overproduce because we have to. Uh, if we cook to order, we don't have to overproduce. If we don't use it, we can use it again the next day. So you see, it's not so much the quantity of waste is different. It's more like the waste streams that are different. So depending on what my services and what I offer, what is important is more at looking into the details and saying, okay, how can we avoid this specifically? Where can we, where can we attack this specific problem? I sort of mentioned this before already. Uh, I just love this picture and I just wanted to throw it out there, not to gross the art, but just to give you also an idea of how difficult it is to make the decision sometimes what waste even is. What do I measure and what is waste? And you see like, for example, uh, intestines, brains, livers, in some countries, in some culinary tradition, they're absolutely highly valuable and the delicacies uh, in, in other, in other countries, their waste or their animal food, uh, chicken feed, a great example as well. Uh, then we talked about bones before already. If you look at the chicken thigh there, what, which part of this is food? Is it only the edible bit or is the whole thing food? And in, but obviously the guests can't eat the bones. So where do I draw this line? Salmon heads, again, very valuable in Japanese cuisine. Uh, waste in Europe. Um, when you look at shellfish like oysters, the weight of the shell is actually more than the weight of the oyster. So is it fair to say this is food waste? Or should we say, no, only the oyster is food waste and the shell isn't? I have come to the conclusion in what we do and how we operate that I don't even want to get into those discussions because once you open that can of worms, like there's no end to it. There's, there's no way to ever clearly defining what food really is because it's deeply personal and deeply cultural. So for me, I have come to the conclusion that the only thing that matters is, is it organic and should it go in a landfill or not? And if it's organic, it should not be in a landfill and there should be a different way to dispose of it if we don't use it ourselves. And, and that's sort of my going theory. Um, that I've tried to also push with my team, but I can tell you that a lot of the time that is something that stirs up emotions because people say, wait, this is not food. Why do you make me measure this? Um, I wanna look at a few case studies just to tell you who is active in this game and what are they doing. I think we also have people on 
this call from all of this area. So um, they are also welcome to correct me if there's anything I'm saying that they don't agree to, or if there's anything you want to add later, or if you have questions, you can also ask them directly because I see uh, Fai is definitely here from SOS. So SOS, the Scholars of Sustenance, is a food rescue and redistribution organization, uh, was formed to address the global food distribution issues and uh, to establish systems to, to uh, use the potential waste and surplus food in a meaningful way for local communities, for communities in Bangkok. Um, they have started in Bali and Bangkok. Now they're also operating in Phuket. It is great working with them. I've been uh, working with SOS in different projects now here at the hotel, but also in different projects over the years. Their strength is they are quite a skilled partner uh, especially when it comes to food hygiene. And this is a big consideration for a food business. When we donate food, how can we guarantee that it's safe to eat when it actually reaches the people that are gonna eat it, right? This, this is a, a big concern. And so to work with a partner like this takes off a lot of the issues of dealing with this because they have the system in place, they build the system, uh, their staff is trained in food hygiene uh, and they do the complicated logistics because getting the logistics of delivering food is crazy. And now you have to imagine they deliver waste food that already has sort of reduced shelf life in comparison to food that is freshly prepared. Uh, and then they also have to deliver it to sort of people that are most in need. So even just to establish that is complicated in logistics. Um, they face, as you could imagine, a lot of challenges. Um, one of the challenges often is this, that to prove that they really follow the standards of food safety and hygiene. That's, that's a challenge to get new players on board because the last thing a food business wants is being sued for, say, even from a community that got the food for free, but for unsafe food, right? Ultimately, as a food producer, especially say you donate stuff that still has your label on it or your logo on it, um, you still are responsible for food safety and hygiene. So how do we guarantee that? How does SOS uh, stand for an operation that takes away this stress and this headache? And then also another thing they uh, struggle with a lot is the cost of operation and, and the funding, as you can imagine, running cool trucks, guaranteeing the food safety training of all their staff, guaranteeing the pickups of even sometimes uh, very small amounts, and especially dealing with sort of this ad hoc uh, issues of the problem, like the ad hoc logistics of dealing with food waste when it occurs, so it can be donated as long as it's fresh, costs a lot of money and costs a big structure. And uh, in Thailand, this is very hard to fund, and uh, SOS is constantly on the lookout to find strong partners that help and also help in the long run. Uh, and this is definitely a challenge. In Europe, food banking is way better organized through the government. So there's a lot of money going into food banking from the European Union and from each member states. Um, therefore, we see a much uh, denser network of food banking in the, uh, in the European Union. However, um, I have a list of food banks uh, throughout the world. If you're in a region, if you're listening to Daniel in a region, and you're not aware of a food bank where you are, I'm pretty sure there is one close by and I'm pretty sure I can give you the contact details. I always say donation is actually a no-brainer. That's something we all should be doing because if you have a strong partner like this, it doesn't really cost you anything um, and they will, they will deal with it. All you gotta do is call and say, look, I have a food product that I either throw out or someone can eat it. And it basically gives you the feeling of helping and gives them product to work with. The impact that SOS uh, has shown from 2016 to 2020, just to put some numbers on it, is they've served about 4.5 million meals. Again, here you see the different measurements. So this is obviously measured in meals served, but ultimately you have to do it in gram or calories. Uh, then you see the measurement on carbon emission reduced, which uh, equals about 2,050 tons of CO2 and the food waste uh, being reduced is about 1,077 tons over the period from 2016 to May 20. They could do a lot more. Um, the problem really is sort of how do you build the structure, let it grow and make sure it's funded and you can continue working with the people you work with. Another case study I want to throw out there is SEPC. Um, SEPC is uh, the Sustainable Events Professional Certification from TSEP Thailand together with the uh, Events Industry Council. 
Um, this is a very interesting idea. It's the idea of taking event planners, and I see there's quite a few event planners on the call today as well, uh, that deal with events uh, permanently. So are the people sitting between the venue, the provider of the food, uh, the provider of the infrastructure, and the customer, um, and sort of help them make better decisions that consider sustainability. So this is not specifically on food waste, it is quite broad. It deals with all sorts of sustainable issues that go along with events. The reason why I think this is quite impactful is because here you really have a bottleneck. Um, and uh, people that running events, uh, like we have a few people from Schloka uh, on the call today, they do massive weddings, uh, huge weddings. If you, if you organize the wedding, for 1,000, 2,000, even more people, um, obviously you single-handedly make a decision for many meals. So training those people to make smarter and more sustainable decisions ultimately has a much bigger impact than making a smarter decision at home daily. So immediately you sort of have three, four, five, six years, seven years worth of changing your own eating behavior in just one event. So going here and, and training events people in making more sustainable decisions, I think, is very clever. Um, here, as a case study, I want to show you something we did uh, at the SEPC from 2020, this year's uh, Sustainable Events Professional Certification. So the certification happens in a two-day uh, course um, on site. And uh, then this year, we try to also, or every year, uh, the, um, the goal also is show events planners hands-on what does a sustainable, what could a sustainable meeting actually look like? What are decisions you can make? For example, here at the bottom, and, and we tackle different problems within this, but, and I only picked the ones in regards to food now to share with you. But here at the bottom, for example, you see a coffee break focused on mangoes. So it's a very beautiful coffee break, uh, but still very simplistic uh, with not a lot of food being offered. Thailand is a country of mangoes. So uh, there was offered about 10 different varieties of mangoes. We had a mango farmer here that grows them organically, talking about the mangoes as people were tasting through the different varieties of mangoes. It's very impactful. It has a, it's very impactful for the participants. Nobody comes to you afterwards and says, oh, there wasn't enough food uh, and complains about sort of the lack of whatever variety. At the same time, it's very minimalistic, but it's sharp and it works and it gets the emotional buy-in and has a strong message at the same time as well. Here's a lunch menu that we did during the SEPC course this uh, year. So this was focused all on plant-based eating, which is a big trend. Again, the, the approach here was to sort of eventify it, turn it into a happening, not just serve a lunch, but build the story around the lunch. So build it up as a plant-based lunch um, not many offers, uh, as you can see here. So we only offered vegetarian and vegan choices anyway. But even then, there was actually only a salad, a soup, um, a burger, a pasta, uh, apples, and a pudding on there, and some crudite in those little grass pots. But again, just the story and the delivery, the way it's been set up, the way it's been uh, phrased, helps a lot to get the buy-in from participants. And, and I think, especially when you do events, when you plan events, the important thing is how do I frame this? What is it, what is that a guest takes away? And again, this goes back a little bit to what I said before. We're used to buying food because there's abundance. We're used to selecting something we like to eat because there's so much variety and we expect variety. When in reality, variety is not quality variety is just quantity and we go away from a dinner from a meal remembering very different things we remember uh, like i said before we remember taste right like we remember something tasted amazing we remember also the setting and the experience we remember a little bit the, the buy and we got from the story from the people from 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 sort of the atmosphere there from obviously love connections uh, meeting other people so these are the things that we need to stress um, to take away variety uh, that's what I strongly believe. And taking away variety ultimately means reducing our food waste massively. There's another coffee break we did um, that was just reusing waste items from previous coffee breaks and the two lunches um, and reportioning them into other dishes and serving those. Um, and again, a bit, it's about the delivery, it's about the story. Um, if you tell people, oh, this is the food waste break um, and you build it up correctly, 
there is a, there's buy-in and then what is important is that the stuff is delicious that it tastes good and then you'll you'll have them on your side so here when we look at the performance there was for this year's uh, SEPC there was 67 participants and in total we generated a waste per cover of 501 grams per person over two days with four coffee breaks and two lunches which is quite incredible I'm quite sure uh, that when you cook at home your dinner you probably generate more food waste than that so it was extremely efficient in reducing food waste with the decisions we made um, overall compared to a regular event there was a carbon emission reduction of 3,646 kilograms and there was still carbon produced so there was a carbon offset purchased over a bit a bit over four tons um, now the last one I'm quite excited about this is Goji this is our big buffet line down in the Marriott Marquis Queens Park. I mentioned to some people that were on the call earlier that we're actually reopening the buffet line today. So it's a, it's a fitting that we talk about Goji today. We've been closed uh, as well during, uh, during COVID. And while we don't get to open the hotel yet, today is the first day of reopening Goji Buffet. Um, I just want to share with you a few things we have done in Goji and sort of that have proven to be impactful. We've done a lot of things uh, in, the, in regards to food waste since 2018, um, but I just picked a few that I think are worth sharing as best practices and might be something you can implement as well. Uh, one thing I do is what we call uh, after buffet review. What this means is after a given meal period, and we do all meal periods uh, in turn, so whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, after meal period, each ind individual kitchen brings everything that's left on the buffet onto a separate table and we analyze it one by one. Now, you, it's, a, it's, it's a huge piece of work, so it's impossible to do this every day, but we do this monthly and you see something every, every month. So every month you realize something that could be done better, whether it is the size of a container, whether it is um, insufficient communication between service and chefs. And just doing that and asking the team the question, okay, why do we have this leftover? What could we do to reduce it? Is it a common occurrence? Uh, is it something we have every day like this? Or is this an outlier? And then comparing that with our measurement data has been proven super, super, super impactful. And it's really this regular thing and this regular reviewing and then analyzing it that really helps also the team to understand what we're looking for. So what we do when we put it on the table is we talk through item by item and we say, can we reuse it? Is it like, is it still edible? Can we rework it into another dish? Or can we rethink the menu? Is it maybe not popular? Do guests not like it? Can we rethink whether we have to offer this at all? Or can we maybe donate it or put it into another waste stream, or does it ultimately have to go to the landfill? And, that, and I tell you, in the beginning, when we started doing this, we found a lot. Now it's getting less and less, and really the main, uh, goal, the, the main sort of achievement there also is that the team already knows what we're looking for, so they already know sort of how to approach this. And service joins there, hygiene joins there. Sometimes outside uh, companies like SOS and so on are also invited in to have a look at that and also tell us, okay, this we cannot handle and donation doesn't make sense. And we can discuss with them together. Can we maybe offer another menu item that'd be easier to donate? Changing the plate size, you hear this a lot. It is effective on buffets, especially if you use a smaller plate, people put less on it. So when we started working on food waste, we changed our plate size to a smaller size and we got rid of all actual dinner plates in the buffet. So it's only small BB plates and medium sized BB plates now. Education is the key. You need the team on board. And um, I've tried to come up with creative and a bit out of the box ways to educate the team, get them involved, uh, get their buy-in, get their emotional buy-in. What we did here is we rented out a beautiful cinema in Bangkok and, uh, and uh, we used Taste the Waste, which is a beautiful German documentary that I find extremely uh, fitting on discussing the global food waste problem. Uh, we got it translated into Thai and we actually had uh, people doing the live Thai version speak in, like uh, sort of what you see at film festivals. So instead of subtitling it, we had people narrating over the story in Thai and we took the entire Goji team out there to show them this documentary together, made it a bit of an event. We had Tesco there, uh, we had SOS there, we had Light Blue there, we had also players in the food waste business there to have a bit of a discussion afterwards in the cinema and keep it there in an event uh, to, to really sort of 
get people thinking about why is this a problem? Why do we have to deal with this? Because if you don't get this emotional buy-in from your team, I think it's very hard to make any difference at all. Um, another thing we, we did is uh, rethink how much do we actually have to present in each buffet station. And what we did for this is make a little guidebook that outlines on each station, what is the minimum acceptable amount that should be displayed. And, then fixing that with the team because we also realized a lot of the time when people overfill buffet dishes, it's insecurity in not knowing sort of what looks good, right? And, and you do need to, when you sell a buffet, uh, you do need to offer a buffet. So you do need to have enough food there for people to walk through and pick something. Um, it's horrible when it looks like everything's been eaten and dishes are empty, but we can decide uh, consciously how much do I need to put there so it looks beautiful and looks like enough right and then just guarantee that we don't do more than that and just standardizing this helped the team a lot to follow those instructions and only fill to that size of acceptable Innovate. Um, this is uh, oyster shells. I touched on oyster shells a little bit before already. Oyster shells was a huge discussion with my team. Uh, there was a lot of uh, the team said it's so unfair that we have to measure oyster shells. They're not even food. So um, I don't know why they got so hung up on oyster shells, but it really kept coming up and again and again. So I started looking into it and started looking into what can we possibly do with the oyster shells. And making a very long story short, um, after approaching a lot of NGOs and sort of not getting the feedback I wanted, um, I found help from Raitong Organics. Uh, Brian from Raitong has been amazing with this. And he said, yeah, sure, I can build wastewater treatments with these. And so what he started doing is building these concrete tanks, um, filling them with our oyster shells. We produce about a ton, like we did it now since we were closed, but in normal operation, Boji alone produces about one ton of oyster shells a month. Um, so that, to take this out of the landfill, uh, was definitely something we wanted to do. What we do now is we separate them, uh, we dry them, and then we send them up to right on Organics. And Brian has started building these wastewater treatments where wastewater just goes into the first tank uh, with the oyster shell, pumped in the second full of oyster shells and the third full of oyster shells. And we'll cut what comes out at the end is actually clean enough to use it to water rice. And it turns out oyster shells, even when there's no more oysters inside, still have an incredible capacity of cleaning water. So what we do now is we collect them and send them up to right home. It's been a super successful project. And since we started this, a lot of other hotels jumped on. And Brian has been able now to offer this also to the organic farmers that he advises and works with and has sort of built this out. And farms in right home, um have the option now to work with him on a wastewater treatment using oyster shells from Bangkok. Another thing that I think is important is to always keep moving, look what's out there, look what's possible. Composting and uh, a composter has been a big topic for us for a long time. The investment is huge. So instead of just buying a machine, what we did uh, beginning of the year um, actually is we had three different suppliers that supply these machines within Thailand coming and setting up a machine for us to test and Michael Riley uh, who was our sustainability manager at the time, did some great work there, getting their buy-in, getting them on board uh, and having them, like convincing them that if they want to have any chance at us buying one of these machines, they better bring us one here for us to test. So we had three different machines, tested them uh, all for the same period of time and actually ultimately found that there's so many problems with running a composting machine that at this point of time, it's not the right solution for our operation. Uh, especially in regards to manning effort, problems that can happen along the line. So now we realize, okay, we have to look for a different solution. But if you don't keep moving, if you don't try to run these things, if you don't sort of go down that route and get some suppliers to, that want to sell you a solution to also follow up with their word and then test it and measure it, uh, you don't know what the right thing is to do. You don't know where to go. So uh, we still haven't completed the composting problem, uh, but uh, it's, this helped us a lot to understand better what those machines actually do and if they could work with our operation. Buying local is something you hear a lot. It's a very complicated problem. Marriott has a standard to buy 75% of our produce local. But at the same time, we also for, for face immediately the problem, how do we even define that? So as married globally, we have the target to buy 75% local. Uh, 
but then as a chef you struggle with how do I decide what a local product is not only how how big do I draw at the frame but then also is it enough if it's a local distributor that works off season with farms in Laos on in Vietnam or or does it have to be the producer directly and so on what we've tried here is to get closer and closer to the farmer and we actually now have a number of, pro uh, of projects it's more than what's on this slide now but this was uh, when I made the slide back then uh, we have a number of produce that we work with directly with the farms and uh, and actually, because of our quantities, we're in a lucky situation. It's a big hotel, so we have the quantities to be able to do that. But it also gives us a lot more control over the quality of the product. And we can pay sort of the same price we pay on the market, but get a better product. Um, and this, like, especially with the pineapple, uh, we've had tremendous success. And I think we have the best pineapple in Bangkok. And we actually get this guest feedback as well. Even in our, in our standardized guest feedback forms uh, online, we've often heard uh, your pineapple is super delicious. And this is sort of a result of working directly with a farmer and building that connection and also building up the expectation of quality that we want to see. I mentioned previously farming. Uh, I have three farms in the hotel. Uh, I, I think it's, it's extremely impactful to farm there, not only for the actual product we're growing. I mean, a lot of the time guests say, um, well, there's no way you can grow all the food you use here. Yes, it isn't. But at the same time, the mind shift, the change of, of value or perception of value of a food product when you actually have to grow it yourself is what really is impactful about, about farming. And going back to what we said before, this one to seven ratio, right? Anything I grow here means maybe not seven times more, but some figure more down the line uh, that didn't have to be wasted. So what we focus on a lot is stuff we use actually in the operation. Um, I've also been adamant on keeping this with chefs. We don't have gardeners and we don't have outside companies doing the farming for us. It is not a showcase project, but it is a kitchen garden and it is chefs uh, managing them. And that also means a lot of the time stuff goes wrong. We had a lot of problems with bugs. Uh, a lot of a lot of harvested that we could have harvested uh, sort of never made it in the kitchen. This happens, right? This happens. But ultimately, that also means the chefs learn how complicated it is to grow something, and how hard it is to grow something delicious, and how much time and work you have to put in and invest to grow something that you can actually use and that you're proud of. But then also that changes the narrative to a guest uh, at the same time. Reworking. And that's what also happens when we analyze what can be reused in other dishes, what can we turn into something else. We have quite a number of projects uh, now where we reuse things that we previously threw away and turn them into something else. What we do, I think a lot of chefs do this anyway, what we did differently now is we also give them special places on the buffet, signpost them differently, sort of give the guests an awareness piece of how much they can contribute to our food waste efforts by eating this dish over another dish. Um, and this has helped very, very much uh, by sort of reducing waste, but at the same time, it also really triggered a lot of conversations with guests that pick up on this. Not every guest is sensitive to this, but you have some that really care, and this can be a great way to start the conversation and then really share what are we doing. This is contrary to what a lot of people believe, but I also wanted to put the, it out there. Centralizing food production is a great way to reduce waste. Um, we in the hotel, have moved a lot of our food product in a commissary style and production style way of working. Um, this is not typical for Asia, it's, it's really unusual. Most hotels have different kitchens that order their different products, that have their own specialists prepare what they're selling. What we're doing now is all fruit and vegetable production is centralized. All stocks, soups, roasts are centralized and we have teams that only manage that. Why is this a huge saving in food waste? Well, it helps you use every part, right? If I handle one kilo of tomatoes and I only need concasse, which is basically from the outside of the tomato, the fleshy bits cut into little cubes, the skin is no use to me and the inside is no use to me. With one kilo of tomatoes, there is no point in keeping that. I don't have a recipe that uses so little. It's too complicated to build the logistical chain to send it back to another kitchen that might be able to use them. And it spoils before I have enough to use. Once centralizing the production, it means I can be very specific 
on what happens with what. So uh, here you see the example of cutting onions, um, say for breakfast, for roasted onions and mushrooms, you will need a very different cut than say for Bruno and the egg station and other cutoff trimmings can still go in sauces and stocks and soups. So centralizing this means the, the centralized kitchen has to decide what part do I use for what and they have a much better yield at using everything than if it was in separate kitchens. Um, this, this is kind of counterproductive because a lot of people um, associate food waste management sort of with small kitchens, local product and so on. But you have to remember that centralizing always means increased efficiency. So there is a bit of a, there's a, there's a bit of a trade-off uh, a lot of the time. So you, you can't do everything right. If you do this right, obviously it makes it harder than to react quickly uh, say with a special product because you have you build a chain that things have to run through uh, but you can also start somewhere you can start with the products that you use most for example and then slowly add on as you see as it works uh, promotions food promotions here you see uh, Jan Hoffmann is a Michelin star chef from Germany who we had here for a promotion so we've done uh, in Goji in the buffet line Michelin star promotion specifically on food waste, on plant-based eating, and so on. Uh, this again helps to get guest buy-in and put the topic out there and also be associated with this topic. And the Michelin star stands for highest quality. Uh, guests in a buffet are excited to taste Michelin star dishes and we've decided to offer them in the buffet while having this conversation about, okay, what is this guy doing that, that is specifically focused on using less animal protein, uh, reducing waste and so on. And, and having him in the buffet is a great sort of engagement piece for guests. This leads me to my last thing, guest communication. This is the key. If you want this to be a successful business measure in the long run, you've got to make sure guests have buy-in in this and don't feel like it is something you do to save money, right? Even if, even if a lot of the measures help you to reduce cost, um, it can never come across as, are they doing that to save money? Because then you very quickly lose that buy -in. Give you an example from Tesco Lotus a few years ago, uh, Compim and I, who, is, who was at the time the sustainability manager for Tesco Thailand, had a conversation on date labeling of fruit and vegetables. And I suggested to take it off because there's no legal standard in Thailand that fruit and vegetables have to be date labeled. But a lot of supermarkets here sell them packaged already in plastic instead of open. So when it's packaged in plastic, a manufacturing date or, or a use by date often gets put on, right? Um, also to make first in first out possible within the shop. But it also discourages guests, uh, discourages supermarket users, buyers from buying something that is almost out of date or that is out of date. Uh, when as vegetables don't go out of date, they go off and then you throw them out. But if they're not off, they're not out of date. Like there's no point in putting a use by date on an apple. So after the conversation, Tesco Lotus decided to take them off, uh, also publicized that uh, on social media and got huge backlash with customers saying, oh, Tesco is just trying to make more money on our food produce. And they actually ultimately had to put them back on uh, because the, the sort of the negative feedback was so overwhelming. So for me, it's super important to remember that if the guests don't get it, if I don't have the guests buy-in, there's no point in doing it because it, like, I risk at some point uh, my, entire, my entire efforts if, if only one guest sort of points out that they feel like they're being ripped off. So it is very important to keep that guest communication alive and make sure that whatever you're doing is also understood, well understood uh, by at least the majority of your guests. When you look at our performance, uh, and I just picked a few things here, um, at Goji, we have in 2019 uh, achieved a certification for the Pledge on Food Waste Gold, which is an international food waste certification standard for restaurants. Um, when you look at when we started, and I just put, picked here food waste per cover, um, so our baseline that we had established for food waste per cover, so for every person eating in the buffet per meal period in 2018, we uh, wasted about 680 grams. And we have reestablished the baseline in 2020, where we have reduced already our baseline to 450 grams. And then uh, this year in March, before we closed, the restaurant, our average was 350 grams per cover. So um, you, you see here already, we have achieved sort of 
a really good and solid reduction. There is a lot of question marks in regards to those data as well. Keeping data consistent, keeping them comparable is extremely difficult, uh, extremely hard. Uh, anyone who's interested in that or anyone who's taking on this project and wants more info, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to share more. I just wanted to give you an overview to see the trend. I want to finish off uh, saying with this beautiful quote from Anthony Bourdain who said, I'm uncomfortable being an advocate. I'm not an activist. I'm very comfortable being a doubter and a skeptic, but I'm pretty sure about this. This is not good. Waste is bad and we can all agree on that. Um, I think you can't say it any better than this. I am also extremely uncomfortable with many of the numbers that are being thrown around. Uh, I'm extremely uncomfortable a lot of the time with the business case behind what is publicized. Um, but I can 100% I can agree that all chefs that I have ever talked to in my life, and it's been a lot, uh, once they understand how incredible the amount of food is we are wasting in our current food systems, they react to this strongly and emotionally, and we all think this is terrible and it should go away, and we cannot continue wasting the amount of food we are wasting now. Um, I leave you with this. If you don't remember anything about today, uh, then remember the following uh, three slides. When you think about is something, something a solution, you, you, be, you will get offered a lot of solutions in the field of food waste. There's many providers for solutions around. Um, the way I think about solutions is in these three steps. Is it a solution? Well, it is only a solution if it helps me prevent food waste. The only thing that I count as solutions are things that stop food waste occurring in the first place. That is a food waste solution. Everything else is secondary and third. And it doesn't mean it's not important. It's important we also work on those problems, but it is not a solution to the food waste problem we have. So redistribution, like we talked about before, donating food, um, uh, keeping food fit for human consumption, keeping in the human consumption phase, uh, but also maybe redistributing into feed and therefore offsetting animal feed that otherwise had to, uh, would have had to be grown. Um, so like this is important, we should work on this. Repurposing like composting, for sure we should work on this. But all of these are not solutions to the food waste problem at hand. They are just solutions to minor problems that we have because of the problem we have with the food waste, uh, with, the, with the food supply chain and the way we handle food and the waste we generate along the, the way. The only solutions that we should be working on are solutions uh, that's not true. Like we should work on all these solutions, but the only solutions that truly are solutions are, are things to do with prevention. Um, and then the two things, if I had to summarize, what are the two things that are most important to, uh, to reducing food waste is simplify. Don't always think that offering a lot is the, is the best way to do. Uh, it's always for me quality over quantity. And it's always what do I remember that matters more than what do I actually offer. And uh, when you think about the meals you've had in your life, when you think about what you remember about food, it is, we, we think it's, it, uh, we, we perceive it at first that if it is quantity, but it, it's not. It is quality of meals, quality of experience that we remember about food. And super importantly, cook delicious food. Um, I cannot stress this enough as a chef. If it isn't delicious, it's already a waste of my time spent, of the ingredients spent. So uh, my aim and goal always is the food has to be delicious or it's not even worth making in the first place. So th this also uh, guidelines a lot of the decisions I make in this realm. So thank you so much for listening to all of this. I put out a few things. If you're now interested in reading a lot more, these are sort of the latest things that we touched on a little bit uh, in the realm of food waste that you could be looking at and downloading. If you do have further questions, if you're looking at doing something in your organization, if you need help with something, feel free to reach out. Um, I can either connect you or help you directly, um, whether you in the, wherever you are in the supply chain. Um, and there's a lot of things that we could have talked about today, but I just wanted to give you that brief overview so you really sort of get uh, a bit of a, a grip on what's actually going on and where you could be going with this. And uh, I think, Giacomo, maybe we open it to questions if anyone has any. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, we are about one hour and a half. So for the uh, Q&A session, I would like to ask... Uh, 
anyone to uh, write in the group chat or ask uh, directly to you uh, any question, but please try to be also uh, brief. Uh, I don't know, I see also many people that are collect connected from Italy. Uh, there are also, uh, beside of Alberto, there is Mattia, and I saw also uh, Dario uh, is in uh, Thailand, uh, and uh, uh, Anna Giulia, that uh, she's uh, connected from uh, Japan. Uh, I don't know other people, maybe uh, they know you uh, personally. And uh, please feel free to ask any question. Maybe I start uh, with one question because I'm very good and you really touch it. Uh, it is related to uh, the buffet. Uh, we well understood uh, uh, how important is uh, the preparation and the forecast, uh, but uh, uh, how do you know or uh, which are the calculations that make you also uh, understand uh, how to properly manage the buffet restaurant? I don't know uh, if the question is clear, but uh, then if you can answer this, I uh, would we'll, uh, like to, to know more as a known expert of what, this field. Let me just rephrase it. What measures do we use to sort of forecast uh, usage? Yeah, the, the consumption or okay. uh, if you have an average based on the guest of the hotel or people are outside, maybe visitors or walk-ins. Yeah, uh, how do you know? Yeah. Very good question, very good question. Um, the, again, um, so it is very hard to forecast what people are eating because it is not only the number of guests you have in a buffet that matters, right? Um, and that's, that's probably what your question is aiming at. Uh, most of the time when people forecast how much has to be produced, it is forecasted only on the number of guests. But a lot of other factors play in and it's things like uh, the gender, right? The, the nationality. Uh, the eating behavior, um, the split of vegetarians and dietary concerns, um, and even things like the weather. Um, if it's raining today, people would eat different food than if it's sunny and hot, right? So all of these things do... Yeah, all of these things do play into how we consume food um, in, in any food setting and, and in a buffet, especially because everything you can eat everything, right? So um, how do you predict this? So what, what we do is, number one, this is already quite different to many buffets. Um, we don't change the menu a lot. Um, we have made the conscious decision that we get much better at forecasting how much we actually have to use um, if we keep it consistent. And also it helps us to reuse items later on. So um, say lunch buffet, we just drag straight into dinner. Um, and then dinner buffet, um, also we, we see what can be pre-prepared only to a point where we could still use say the protein or the sauce on the next uh, menu period. So we, we made this con conscious decision to just keep rotation on buffet minimal. A lot of hotels I've worked at in the past, you build these huge buffet rotation tables and, uh, and you sort of like go through whatever, maybe even a seven day rotation, maybe even a 10 day rotation for the buffet. Um, not only is that a lot of work to cook that consistently well, um, but it also ultimately produces more waste. So what I said before, simplifying the offering is already a huge impact on how much you're gonna waste. And then as on the measures that we use uh, day to day, the one thing is covers, like number forecasted uh, covers, yes. The other thing is we do do an analysis of what groups are in this uh, number daily. So we do look at um, how many of the, the cover number are coming from a certain group? What is the nationality of the group? Do we have the group in house already for a while and maybe know something about their eating behavior? Um, and that goes into how we prepare the buffet setup. So this happens in the briefing daily and gets communicated to all the team and all the stations. And the other thing we've established new in the buffet that wasn't there before we started looking at food waste is we do a call, uh, a 50% cover call. So when service registers that 50% of uh, the covers of the restaurant have been accepted, taken to the table, seated, and walk the restaurant and probably take in their first plate. They go around and inform each station chef and say 50%. And then they do the same thing again when it comes closer to say 80, 90% of all people being seated. And this just helps 
with a refill, right? Because what happens a lot if you've managed a coffee before, some people, all the chefs here in here will relate to this. What happens a lot of the time is sort of, you get in this power period where you just get a lot of guests uh, approaching your buffet. So sort of the people that came earlier do their third, fourth round. And the people that came, came just later, they just start. And you have a lot of guests at a buffet and you feel like, oh my God, I need more food. And you work, work, work and refill. And then you realize about 15 minutes later that all of that was overfilled because the biggest rush is over. So to, to build a system around this and sort of have these call outs from service saying, guys, 80% mark, right? Or now everyone's in, everyone's seated, um, really helps the chefs to know when are we over that rush and when do I pull my production back. Okay, that's very interesting to, to know and uh, about it. So let's see if uh, someone else has uh, any question. Uh, now is the right moment to ask. Uh, maybe while we wait, um, another question that might be is uh, how influent do you see the packaging? Do you think that by reducing uh, the plastic uh, or uh, the packaging, uh, that could be a different result also in terms of uh, consumption from uh, restaurants and uh, hotels? Well, what we see now is this in relation to, uh, to the current situation. What we see now is definitely, definitely an increase in consumption of packaging again. And I imagine this is the same in all countries in Thailand. The current figures that are thrown around are something like a 60% increase um, of uh, single use packaging material. So that is concerning for sure, um, that is concerning. And in regards to packaging uh, waste, triggering food waste, obviously if you pack portions individually, you have to assume some sort of a standard portion. And I think that's what we looked at before when we looked at numbers of buffet versus a la carte service. Um, so setting a standard of how big a sandwich, for example, has to be how much somebody wants to eat instead of doing small sandwiches and allowing a guest to pick one, two or three, um, definitely also leads to more food waste ultimately because you have to assume a standard serving size. And, and that means some people will think it's too much and some people will not be full and maybe take a second one and then maybe leave some of that. I've also received a, a private message now saying, are we gonna share the recording of the session? I think uh, Giacomo, you can uh, say more on this. Ah, yes, someone texted me also to ask the same, and I say yes. Uh, we will upload this video uh, by Monday on our YouTube channel, uh, the Thailand Chamber of Commerce uh, on uh, YouTube. Uh, this uh, will be present in a playlist uh, with all the episodes of uh, Thailand Food Innovation, and uh, you are all invited to follow us on our social media. Uh, YouTube uh, and also next week with the last episode of this series for the moment and we will resume it on uh, uh, October again. Uh, okay, uh, I don't know if there are uh, other questions, otherwise I would say that uh, this is it. Uh, I would like to invite everyone to uh, come and meet uh, uh, Chef uh, Daniel in person. Okay, one moment, there is one question from Anna Julia. Uh, Daniel, can you read yeah. it from, uh, from yes, the group? The, the question is, uh, have we ever had issues in offering uh, different food choices or uh, if we decided not to serve a particular food item because of its impact, has there been complaints? Um, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And, uh, and that, that's, that's also why it is a very, a very difficult case to make sometimes. And, uh, and like I said before, um, my personal approach and, and sort of for us as a hotel is always that if we don't have the guest buy-in uh, and, it, and it sort of hinders us from selling our product then maybe uh, we have to prepare that first and maybe the time is not right to do that. And a lot of the time that means sort of a setup, right? Like building sort of a case around it. So you, you definitely have to be creative with how you sell <laughs> how you sell your, your point. And, and I've, you know, I've personally received complaints from customers about other hotels, and I don't want to mention, but, but like say uh, I had a customer who, who uh, was adamant about that he doesn't care at all about food waste and that, that it is not something that he considers important, uh, but that he feels in our buffet line, um, it is more, the focus is on quality 
not on like on offering better quality of food, not on food waste, but that he had been to a different hotel where there was signage on the table saying eat less, save more. And he was completely, uh, com completely not even not understanding, but just like basically saying, I will never set up foot in that hotel again. So yes, you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful on how you work things. How do you get that customer buy-in? And how do you avoid complaints? And if they occur, how do you deal with them? Because I do think um, that, and, and I, I honestly, I, I, I tell you that I personally think using sustainability as an excuse, I get angry about that. Like I get, I get sometimes frustrated when people say, oh, you know, we're not doing that because we're sustainable. So like your problem. Um, I, I don't think sustainability is an excuse to offer less. I don't think uh, doing something more sustainable means like we have to go back to, uh, to uh, like I said before, not having strawberry cake or not drinking coffee in Italy. Um, people that propose these solutions, they might be on the track of how to, how to, on the only solution to achieve zero waste in total, but it is not a feasible solution for the systems we currently work in and used to. And, and so for me, it is equally as important to offer the best possible, most delicious food as it is to do so as sustainably as possible. And, and it really is about how do we push those benchmarks of what is acceptable and how do we always question if we really have reached the best accept acceptable loss or if we can do better, right? This, this is, I think, sort of the question that, that uh, concerns me a lot and that, that I work on a lot um, in trying to to, to go lower as low as, as possibly uh, as possible but but you can't do so without having buy-in from customers so yeah it, it is it's definitely a tricky it's definitely tricky to deal uh, with how do we work this and how we put it out there and uh, it's very interesting also I guess that uh, uh, in your case uh, uh, you you also prefer uh, local uh, as we saw with the veggies fruits and uh, which is your uh, your point of view regarding uh, uh, being uh, local uh, and uh, going global or is also this kind of mix with local food uh, that uh, Sawan is trying to uh, produce uh, uh, the products directly uh, uh, for example I know that there are many uh, Italians, uh, like here we have Dario from uh, Pluto Ice Cream uh, making Italian gelato, but there are others that are uh, roasting uh, coffee beans to make Italian coffee in Thailand, and uh, other making cheese or salami and uh, whatsoever. Uh, what, what do you think about this? Is it something that you also consider uh, since you are also uh, having the uh, chicken farm uh, or? Uh, it's curious also to know about this if you can share with us. Uh, go, uh, yeah, that's, that's again a very good question, but also a very big question. Uh, just, just the topic of what does it mean to buy local uh, could easily fill another hour and a half. Um, the first thing I want to say on, on that question is that it's, I think it's over promoted because our food systems don't even offer something truly local or it's very very few products that are truly local and when we when we see that imagery or when we when we hear the narrative of buying local you, you see pictures of whatever a farmer's market and the person growing the carrots selling them directly now this is firstly firstly there's, there's, there's also a case we made that these carrots might not even be local in the sense that everything that went in these carrots is local because the farmer might well be using, even organic farmers might be using uh, organic fertilizers or, or organic certified pesticides, which are not being produced in Thailand. So they might be imported. Um, the nitrites for those uh, fertilizers might be made in Brazil for all we know, and maybe manufactured in Europe where, they, where there's a lot more certification uh, or in India and then shipped through a European company to Thailand, right? So how local is this carrot and how big do we, do we sort of draw the circle on what it means to buy local? Um, and, and like you said, right, is a local gelato, is that a gelato made by someone in Bangkok with imported milk from Italy? Or is it only local gelato if it is Thai milk uh, 
from Thailand, the flavorings, uh, like the flavorings I used to make the gelato, produced locally from local industry, the packaging made locally, like how, how strict are we on this, right? And so there is no measures. There, there, there literally isn't any. There's, there's a lot of measures out there, but there's nothing comparable. So to, to bring this together and truly show the impact of what it means to go local is, is impossible at this point in time. Nonetheless, we do know that, like I said before, the longer the supply chain, the more complicated it gets. And I also want to add to this that we don't, in the food business, uh, and this is what made the food waste index so much more complicated in, re in comparison to the food loss index. In the food business, we don't deal with carrots, right? We deal with a pizza, you know? And it's also like how many products already go into the pizza? Um, how many sort of different suppliers already contribute to just making one pizza? Uh, say, you know, say you have the, uh, if you have, if you have, and then like pizza is maybe a good example in this context. If you if you have a certified um, uh, pizza that follows uh, the standard, um, then obviously you have to buy the San Marzano tomatoes and you have to buy the Italian mozzarella. There, it's maybe even controllable. But if you do just any pizza, like say you are Pizza Hut or whatever, and you have different suppliers supplying your base products in every country, you have someone making the sauces, someone making the cheeses, the milk coming from you don't even know where, the wheat flour, maybe you buy local, Thai wheat flour uses, a, UFM for example, is a big producer of Thai local wheat flour, there's, a, there's no Thai wheat, so they're not they're not making wheat, they're making local wheat flour, but they're not making it from local wheat. They're purchasing wheat from wherever it's cheapest on the commodity market. So it might be from Turkey, it might be from Poland, it might be from Germany, it might be from Australia, uh, or it might be from South America, right? And it, it probably changes. And, and there's this uh, famous statistic about burgers in the US um, that in one, in one frozen patty uh, for a burger that you you purchase in the US, like in, in one burger patty from McDonald's or Burger King or you name them, is at least 800 different carcasses. So at least 800 different cows went into that one patty. Um, so, so to understand how complicated and how connected our food chains are, it's very hard to even say what a local product is. So my, my answer is this, yes, we should buy local, but we don't really understand what that means. So for me, it's always been way more important to ask the question, who am I working with? What are they working on? What are their values? Where are they buying the product? And what are the questions they are asking their suppliers down the line? That sort of means I can work with someone who sells gelato in, uh, in Bangkok um, if they have a very good understanding of what is valuable in food and in the food chain and, and flavor is just as important as sustainability, but both of them for me uh, weigh equally as important. So if somebody does that here and the gelato that uh, finally is either made here or maybe it's imported, uh, but, but we've done the homework and we've looked at sort of CO2 uh, in the supply chain, flying it in from Italy, uh, comparing that to local options, comparing that with quality and, uh, and, and with sort of total uh, total output, then we can maybe make an informed decision on that one gelato, right? And, and that's sort of what it really comes down to. It comes down to taking product by product and, and pulling it apart and, and pulling it into its pieces. And that's again, just to link this back, um, it is impossible when you try to offer the most variety in the world because it's incredible amounts of work even just for one product. So if you try to offer uh, hundreds, thousands of items, if you try to uh, display the biggest variety there is, it becomes so hard. It also becomes completely unaffordable to, to manage them. So you, you, like my way of saying we do local is find people you can work with, uh, work with them and ask the questions and build the case for each independent product. And then also it goes down to say, be true to those suppliers, right? Like, like sort of don't drop someone just because their price is now more expensive because they have some sort of supply issues down the line. Um, if, if I have this connection to a local supplier that understands their product, they can come to me, they can explain this, and we can make a decision to continue doing it for the time being until maybe the situation changes. Sorry, it was a very long answer, but, uh, but, but I feel it's, it's a... It's a like buying local is, is, a, is very much something you read in a lot of communication on how to do more sustainable food, uh, but it is 
and it is just a statement that is very hard to fill with life and reality of the food business. Okay, no, no, it's uh, on these words that uh, maybe I would like to, to conclude uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Daniel, on behalf of the Titan Chamber of Commerce for uh, this uh, really uh, astonishing uh, webinar in terms of contents uh, and also for sharing your expertise with all of us. Uh, okay, so uh, we close it here. Uh, we pass uh, the two hours almost, and uh, uh, we'd like to invite everyone to follow us uh, and uh, to uh, go to your restaurants uh, and hotel. And uh, the episode will be uploaded by Monday, and uh, we'll share with all of you also the link uh, in case you miss something you want to uh, replay the video. Uh, thank you very much. I wish you all of you uh, a happy weekend and uh, let's keep it. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much, everyone.